The British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, wrote in his uh, biography, his autobiography, about some friends who parent, whose parents were immigrants to America. In fact, they were Jews that escaped from Europe to America, the United States, in order to find safety. The rest of their lives, they lived out on U.S. soil. They lived somewhat impoverished lives, but nevertheless, when they died, there was a safety box that the children uh, searched that mom had, and, and they opened it. And of course, it was a jewelry box, and there was some jewelry in there, but nothing of great value. What surprised them is beside the safety box was another safety box. And it was locked and had no key. They didn't know about this one. So they had no choice but to drill it open. And when they opened it up, they saw there an item that was wrapped many times. And as they unwrapped it, they wondered what precious item, what precious jewel was in there. But it didn't feel like a jewel. And as they unwrapped it, they discovered there was an envelope. Intrigued with the envelope, they opened it. And inside, they discovered mom and dad's U.S. citizenship papers. Nothing more. To those parents, more precious than jewels, more precious than any other possession, was their citizenship papers. Now how many of you have citizenship papers in a top drawer or a safety box somewhere? Anyone? A couple of you. All right, yes, John. You were born in Holland, weren't you? So some of you do. And so you know it's important. You understand the importance of that. It's valuable to you. It's not something to be taken for granted. Well, how many of you here are Canadian citizens? Now, I thought as much. Are you proud to be Canadians? Yes, are you? Yes. If somebody asked you if you were proud to be Canadian, would you say, well, I am, eh? <laughs> Sorry about that, but I was on, when we, Susie and I were down in the south for our, our vacation, somebody said to me, so you're Canadian. I went, well, how do you know that? And they said, well, when my husband bumped into you, you said sorry. <laughs> I'm Canadian through and through. Our identity is that of being Canadian. And during Lent, we are exploring our identity, except our identity in Christ. Okay? And this is the theme of Matthew's Gospel. And hopefully after I share with you uh, what I'm going to this morning, you will be motivated, you'll be inspired to reread Matthew's Gospel and to see it in a whole new light. Because I do believe, and this is, I love doing this, I love sharing material with people that they probably don't know, but will transform the way they understand the Scriptures. You might not have realized, for example, that Matthew, when he was writing, he was writing to a group of people who were struggling with their identity. So let me explain. The audience, the recipients to whom Matthew was writing were first century Jewish Christians. They were Jewish people who had become Christians, followers of Christ. Now, to fully understand the significance of this, understand that all Jewish people in those days had their identity tied to the understanding that they were children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Along with that, they believed that they were God's chosen. As a nation, as a race, they were the apple of God's eye. And in terms of their worship, their identity was tied to a physical structure called the temple, where they were, in so many times a year, to gather together, and they were to offer animal sacrifices as an expression of worship to God. They were, obedient, they were to be obedient to God's law as given through Moses. And this, this framed their identity. Temple worship, animal sacrifice, obeying the law as given to Moses, framed who they were as they compelled themselves to live by those values, those principles. They were faithful Jews, the apple of God's eye. But in 70 AD, and I know this is a little history lesson, but it's very interesting, as you will see. 
The temple of Jerusalem, their temple was destroyed by the Romans. And so this question emerged, how do we remain Jewish, how do we remain faithful to God without the temple and the opportunity to worship Him through sacrifice? Who are we? Then in 90 AD, the temple of Jerusalem, or, or I'm sorry, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, gathered in a place called Jamnia, and they created what we know as modern-day Judaism. That is, they answered the question, how do we worship God without a temple, without animal sacrifice? And they developed a new identity in a sense that when they worship, they recite the Torah. They recite the Bible. That is what becomes sacred to them in place of the other. And this all happened by the time Matthew wrote his gospel in the late first century. Matthew wrote towards the end of the first century. Now, just to make it a little bit more interesting, in those days, Judaism included a number of sects. Just like Protestants has all sorts of denominations, from Catholic to, well, Christianity has all sorts of denominations from Catholic to Protestant, and with each of those, all sorts of other divisions. Judaism was divided as well, had all sorts of expressions. There was the Pharisees, there was the Sadducees, there were the Essenes, and also among them, there was this new group called the Nazarene. These were the followers of Jesus from Nazareth, and they were early on referred to as the Nazarene by other Jews. Now, for these followers of Jesus who were also Jews, they still considered themselves to be faithful Jews. Just because they had become followers of Christ didn't mean that they stopped practicing Judaism. They were still faithful Jews, it's just that they believed that they had found the Messiah. So they continued to go to synagogue, they continued to go to the temple, they continued to do it all. They just believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They still saw themselves as faithful Jews, but ones who had discovered Jesus as the Messiah. But then after 70 AD, when the temple had been destroyed, like every other Jewish sect, they too wondered who they were. What does this mean for them? And this is why the book of Hebrews tells them, don't worry about that. There's no need for animal sacrifice anymore. Jesus was the sacrifice once for all. It's no longer important. And that's why Paul writes, don't worry about the fact that there's no physical temple because you are now temples of the Holy Spirit. It's all in the wake of this being taken away, the temple and the sacrificial system. But there was one more dramatic event that changed everything. And it changed everything for these Jewish Nazarene, these Jewish people that had become Christians. In 90 AD, at the Council of Jamnia, the New Judaism was formed, and it required that all worshippers, when they worship, recite 18 benedictions. A benediction is something that starts usually with the words, blessed are those. And the first benediction was great, because it said, blessed are you, Lord our God, the God of our fathers Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that was good. And all the blessings were ascribing glory to God. So that was good, except when it hit number 12. The 12th blessing, which was also a curse, was called the Burke Hamanim. And this is how it read. And imagine being a first century Jew who had become a Christian, now being compelled to say this if you want to remain a Jew. For the apostates... Let there be no hope, and may the kingdom of the arrogant be quickly uprooted in our days, and may the Nazarene and the Menim instantly perish. May they be blotted out from the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Blessed are you, Lord, who humbles the arrogant. And so now, this is in a sense, the Christians, the followers of Jesus being given the boot. They're being, the Menim is anyone who doesn't believe, as, as modern day Judaism practices, but over and above that, they specified the Nazarene. They were especially concerned about the followers of Jesus. And if anyone is a part of that and wants to be Jew, they have to say a curse against them. So in a sense, they were given the boot. You can no longer be a part 
of Judaism, you can no longer come to synagogue, you can no longer be a part of the larger Jewish family. This is the background to Matthew's Gospel. Everything he writes is with this in mind. That is why in Matthew when we read the Beatitudes and they start out, blessed are the persecuted. He's giving a whole set of other benedictions in contrast to what has been superimposed upon them. So you wonder what impact this had on these first century followers of Christ. They now were asking themselves, well, who am I? Where do I fit? What is my identity? How am I supposed to behave? Now, have you ever noticed that men, it was women too, but in particularly men for some reason, that their identity is often totally embodied in their vocation, what they do for a living. So much so that many men, when they retire at 65, within a few months, they die. Have you noticed that? The separation from their vocation affects them so much that they don't know how to live their lives and their body. It's not a rule, but it's often observed. This is certainly what happened with my grandfather. Isn't that true, Mom? Retired and with a short while, he died. A parent who has been called mom or dad, but then loses a child, will also grieve a loss of identity. A spouse who has been married for how many years and is suddenly abandoned and divorced has to rediscover who they are in this society. In 2004, I suddenly became a bachelor. In the context of which I was a pastor, that meant I no longer fit. So I separated myself from pastoral ministry for four years. I may have well been lost, not knowing where I fit, except that I knew my identity in Christ. And I'm here from personal spirit saying the difference that that made. I knew that God was with me through it all. And so this is to whom Matthew is writing. And this is what his message is about. It's about letting go of those identities that can be pulled out from under us and receiving a radical new identity. An identity as a citizen of the kingdom of God. For that is what Matthew is writing about. You no longer belong to this world, but there's another kingdom, there's another dimension which you are a significant part. Now when you read Matthew, you can be, you can be aware of what is happening in the background. For example, Matthew is the one who emphasizes a new king and a new kingdom. Matthew is the one that emphasizes that Christ is the king, and he's the one that emphasizes that our identity is no longer in the things of this world, but in a new world. Matthew is the one who mentions that three kings visit Jesus on his birth. Matthew is the one that introduces the list of new benedictions. Matthew is the one who records that in this world we are to lay up treasures in heaven. Matthew highlights that Jesus was extolled as king riding on the colt into Jerusalem. Matthew is the one who records Jesus' words that we will all stand before the king and sheep will be on his right and the goats on his left. And Matthew is the one who records that Jesus was crucified and above him there was, there was posted this placard that said, Jesus, the king of the Jews. It's all the way through from start to finish because Matthew was writing to Jewish people who had become followers of Christ that no longer knew who they were and they were searching for a new identity, and their identity was that they were now citizens of heaven, significant participants in the kingdom of God. You might be Jewish, you might be American, you might be Canadian, but if you are a follower of Christ, you are a citizen of heaven. This is not the world we were created for, but we are just preparing for another. Ephesians 2.19 Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. Philippians 3.20 But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as such, because we are now citizens of a new kingdom, 
Matthew says, rejoice, rejoice, your reward is great in heaven, but remember while you are here, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of this world. This is your role. This is who you are. <coughs> now, how many of you have watched the game show, The Family Feud? Come on. Anybody not seen The Family Feud? The one who was born in Holland? <laughs> Mommy, okay, you have seen the family feud. She lives. <laughs> <laughs> How many? I make the motion that he goes to a new church. <laughs> the family feud. It's a game show. What happens in this game show is a hundred people are surveyed, and they respond to various survey questions. And on 2012, a contestant had to provide the top answers to the following survey question. A hundred people were asked this question. When someone mentions the king, to whom might he or she be referring? Okay. And there's the answer. He says Elvis. Eighty-one people said Elvis Presley is the king. Two people said Burger King. Three people said Martin Luther King. Seven people said Jesus. The king, Elvis, Versus Jesus. You're a follower of Christ, am I right? Yes. I sure hope you are. Your answer should be Jesus is the King. It's your identity. You are a citizen of heaven, an occupant of the kingdom of God. This is who you are. Now, before the national borders were established, the kings of Laos and Vietnam reached an agreement together on taxation in the border areas between the countries, or where the countries they thought would stop and start. So, those who ate long, or those who ate short grain rice, those who built their houses on stilts and decorated them with Indian style serpents were considered Laotians. On the other hand, those who ate long grain rice, built their houses on the ground and decorated them with Chinese style dragons were considered the Vietnamese. So there was no border established, but based on the cultural values which you embraced, determined your citizenship. <coughs> Isn't that interesting? The exact location of a person's home is not what determined their nationality, but what cultural values that they embraced. And so it is with us. We live in this world, but we are truly a part of God's kingdom. And that needs to be reflected in the way we live our lives. Because it's who we are. We are citizens of heaven. We are members of the kingdom of God. It's our identity. A soldier was brought before Alexander the Great. He stood before Alexander the Great face to face. He had committed an incomprehensible crime. He was charged with gross misconduct. The soldier pleaded guilty, and Alexander the Great asked this soldier his name, and the soldier said, My name is Alexander. My name is also Alexander. And Alexander the Great immediately looked up, his eyes filled with fire, and he looked at this soldier and he said, You either change your name or you change your conduct. No man can bear the name of Alexander and do what you have done. And I wonder, because Christ is our King, and we are called Christians, which means little Christ, we bear the name of Christ, if Christ would ever say to us, change your name and change your conduct. Because you are citizens of heaven. You are members of the kingdom of God. Harry C. Morrison was a great missionary. He served in Africa for over 40 years. He and his wife were returning to America. And as they were traveling back on the ship, he was wondering if anybody would remember him. But unknown to Henry Morrison, also on the ship at that time, was Teddy Roosevelt. He, the President of the United States, he had gone to Africa on a hunting trip as an excursion. And as they came to shore, New York, 
Henry saw that there were thousands of people there, there with all sorts of noisemakers and signs saying, welcome home. And he thought to himself, they didn't forget us. They remembered. But when he got off the ship, there was no one there. Everyone had left. He had realized that they were all there for the President of the United States. And he turned to his wife and he said, honey, I just don't get it. For 40 years, we poured our lives in ministry and service into ministry and service, and we come back to America, and not a single soul comes to welcome us home. His wife came and sat down alongside him. She put her hand on his shoulder, and she comforted him with words that he would never forget. She said, Henry, you have forgotten something. We're not home yet. who you are. You are a citizen of heaven. You are strangers in a foreign land. This is not your home. We need to live our lives more mindfully that this is about preparing for the next. And while we are here, Matthew is the one who chose to echo the words of Jesus who said, you are salt you are here to preserve the standards of righteousness. You are light to make the good news known. That is what is important. We are citizens of heaven, and not one of us is holy heaven. Heavenly Father, help us to be encouraged and strengthened by the identity we have in Christ. And though we sometimes find value and significance in our relationship to others or to our jobs or to the things we possess. We need to learn, Lord, we know that to, to hold all things loosely because we're not home yet and there's not a thing we can take with us except our relationship with you. Help us to be more mindful of how we live this life so that we can be prepared for our time with you. In Jesus' name.